Welcome, everyone, to this long overdue next episode of the Canaman podcast. I'm here today with uh, the lovely Alex Fraser of Grow Pharma. We've known each other for quite a while now, Alex. Uh, yeah. Seen just about everything that the cannabis industry has to offer and what's going on in the sort of community at the moment and the various ecosystems around the UK. Um, and so I thought I'd invite the man himself to have a bit of a discussion with us and go through, I guess, how we've got here, how the industry has got here and what's maybe to come over the next few years based on what we've seen so far. So yep. I'll let well, Alex give himself a little intro here uh, and uh, hand it over to you, Alex, and then we'll start off with maybe a bit of a, a history of the cannabis industry and how we've got to where we are today. But uh, yeah, please, Alex, thank present. you. and Exactly. Well, no, thank thank you for having me on the show. It's it's lovely to be here. Um, like I said, we've been friends for a while, so it just feels right to be doing um interviews with yourself. Um, really looking forward to chatting through uh, all the interesting and and mad and crazy world of of cannabis. Um, to to give a sort of brief introduction to myself, I won't I won't do the full story, and, and there'll be other bits that will become evident as we go through the history. And you know, I only know my my perspective on things, so you know where I slot into that, I suppose, and as much as I know around that, but um. But so I, I am a patient, first and foremost. Um, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in 2010. I was 19 years old, um, just went to uni. It was at the end of my first year. And um, that, that really changed my life, uh, you know, irrevocably for, for, for the rest of my life. It, it, you know, it, since then, I've you know, dealt with a huge amount of pain, a huge amount of symptoms, a huge amount of problems as, as a result um, of, of that diagnosis. And um, one of the things that became evident very, very quickly was that when I used cannabis, which I was doing you know, quite casually, um, you know, I was a student in Brighton and, you know, go to parties and, uh, and gigs and things and, and there'd be cannabis there. And I noticed that those symptoms were, were lessened. And um, to cut a long story short, I got very frustrated that, that this wasn't a legal option for me, something that was, you know, really helping me get through a very difficult time. Um, in 2014, with alongside, a, 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 you know, a few other patients, we'd all connected on social media um launched an organization called the united patients alliance it's one of the four uh, directors um and founders of that organization uh from 2014 up until uh, 2018 um and we were really the first organization in the uk the first uh, sort of adv ad uh, activist or advocate um organization that really focused on medical cannabis rather than sort of the wider topic and and really went and looked at what what do we need to do in terms of changing legislation to to move this forward um, we sort of removed ourselves from uh, the subculture in terms of we didn't, you know, uh, put the leaf in our logos. We didn't use the color green even. Uh, we went with purple branding, um, which is often sort of associated with chronic health conditions. Um, and, you know, we we dressed up in suits and we went on TV and we, you know, we did uh, delegations of patients to Parliament to give evidence. We did loads of different things uh, to really try and raise the issue. We, did, we organized protests and, uh, and, and political events and community events and, and all sorts of other things. And um, it was incredibly successful. It was surprisingly successful. I don't think we realized when we launched, uh, we launched in yeah, so 2014, summer of 2014 down in Brighton. And we had David Nutt and, and Caroline Lucas, sorry, Professor David Nutt, I should say, it's drug science, Caroline Lucas, the Green MP, um, Jason Reed from, from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, although I think they've changed that, um, that, that name, that moniker. So, uh, but, but he's a great guy and it's a great organization still to this day. Um, at that launch night, it was really powerful. We were in a church in Brighton and there was about 150 people in the audience. And um, we had a few people lined up to talk, including myself and, and the other patients that we were sort of launching with. And then we also invited other people to come up and, and talk and say their piece for five, 10 minutes if they were, you know, patients who had found cannabis beneficial. And the point was to just stand up and show that, you know, these are normal everyday people. Um, they're forced to be criminals. This thing really helps them. This should be, you know, provided in a, in a legal context and in a medical context. Um, and that was a model that I, you know, I ran with. I thought that that event really changed my life. Um, it was incredibly empowering to stand up in front of a crowd of people and say, I use cannabis and essentially was applauded for that, not just for using cannabis, but for standing up and talking about it and, and raising the issue. And um, that was hugely powerful to me. So, you know, I, the way I looked at it was that organization could essentially present itself as a podium for patients across the country to stand on and to say their piece. 
without you know doing so alone and i think it, you know power in numbers i think it, it's one thing to stand up on your own and say you know to risk publicly talking about illegal drug use um and you know and your chronic health issue all of these things are quite stressful to talk about publicly but to do it the group of people felt felt manageable um and and felt empowering like i say so that was a model that i i ran with and the community events were based around that model we'd go around the country and we'd essentially talk a little bit ourselves about the issues about what we're trying to do we'd invite local politicians police chiefs and what have you to the meeting um with the understanding of course of the police chiefs that they weren't going to arrest anyone um of course or we politely said please do not come um and they were they were very successful events and and you know it just it just snowballed um to a point where you know we became one of the the sort of the main cannabis advocacy groups in the uk it was it was lovely it was also very stressful it was a lot of work for people who were also suffering i was much more unwell then than i am than i am now and I'll talk a little bit about my personal health journey later on and or maybe on another episode you were saying earlier weren't we there's there's so much to say can we finish? lots can to we get through i know and I'm, I'm already rambling so to cut to cut a bit of a long story short and i suppose that's that's the the united patients alliance piece and i think that's important to talk about because an organization that has um its reputation has been tainted by things and, and you know we can talk about that too um and, and you know that makes me very sad but uh certainly did some really good work there and, and you know certainly that's the springboard that um, led me to where I am now. So we had a law change in 2018. A lot of people don't know this, that actually there was a law change in November the 1st, 2018, uh, that enabled wider prescribing of cannabis medicines in private settings. That's the sort of the summary of that. Was the end. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more that, about that, I'm sure, later. Um, and just literally just before that happened, um, there was there was basically a, a personal reason for me to leave the organization. It just uh, it, it was a, an issue with, with some of the relationships between people in the organization. And I felt like the easiest thing to do was, um, you know, it felt like we were really getting somewhere. The campaigns, uh, you know, featuring the young epileptic children over that summer were really in full swing. And I thought, well, you know, I can free up some time and go and help them with that. Um, and I can also think about, you know, what I'm going to do next. Um, so a couple of months later, I launched the consultancy, just myself, working for myself, um set up a small business and essentially went to networking events which i think is where we met the first time at one of those yes. networking events the first wednesdays we should talk about them as well in a, in a bit i will I'll, I'll briefly touch on them now but we should go back to it because they were fascinating uh, networking events with loads of great people from the cannabis industry there investors cbd companies people who wanted interesting to set up medical there was lots of you know great conversations going on um and I basically used those events to find me, you know, work on a sort of case by case basis. Did that quite well for about six to seven months. Uh, and then a company called Grow came and uh, you can see their logo up here um, and picked me up and said, look, come, come and work for us. I joined them in February 2019. Uh, a week later, we did the first bulk import of uh, pharmaceutical grade cannabis into the UK, um, at least since something like the 1920s 1930s i'm not even sure when they stopped whether they ever imported it or whether it was growing here back then but anyway in modern times um and uh and i've been with them ever since it'll be it'll be four years in february so um have been essentially building the medical cannabis industry um with grow uh and that you know i'm sure we can talk more about about the different companies there's, there's the wider grow group and then there's grow pharma but my work is a lot of uh, based around educating and supporting healthcare professionals and it's going from knowing nothing about cannabis to being a you know, prescriber working in a clinic and everything in between, um, working with producers, the licensed producers of cannabis medicines who want to launch their products in the UK. We help them do that. Uh, and then we're also doing as much as we can do within within the you know the regulations in terms of building awareness, um, you know, marketing stuff like, like like what we're doing here today. So talking about the industry um, and you know supporting sort of patient access where where we can. That's the the real hard thing is uh, is trying to build some awareness around this where we are like we're essentially a supplier of controlled drugs so we're very limited and we can't just put an ad up on the on the tube or on on the television but um, so it's how do we reach the many people <clears throat> who might stand to benefit from these medicines and that's the that's the hurdle that's the challenge that I deal with day to day so yeah it's good fun it's a really fascinating company it's an incredible industry it's very young it's very naive and, and sort of um, you know, I think there's a lot that needs to change to get it to where it needs to be. Um, but yeah, we can we can dig into this. I've been waffling for a little bit now. You, I'm sure you had some some more specific. We are going <laughs> to dig right into some of this, Alex. Yeah, yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, 
for people who maybe aren't as familiar with these cannabis communities and um, what those maybe looked like, mm -hmm. would you be able to paint a bit of a picture as to how those worked, Alex, and how and what yeah, the purpose of wow. those was back in the day, sort of pre-2018? <laughs> so as far as I know, and I'm sure it goes back further, and I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody who's been in the scene for a while, as far as I know, the first sort of really organized group was the LCA, and that was the Legalized Cannabis Alliance. This was, I think, I think they sort of came to a fore in, in the 90s. Um, you had CLEAR, which is still around today. It's Cannabis Law Reform and Education. I don't quite know what it stands for. Um, and they're, they're still around today, and they sort of an offshoot from the LCA. Um, and that was very controversial. I know that a lot of people were very happy that, uh, you know, that it, it becomes the... The situation and this isn't to put those two organizations on the spot it's just the first example and it happens again and again and again as these different groups turn up so you've got the uk cannabis social clubs which is was sort of proliferating that social club model um and were very active around sort of i guess 2010 to 2015 particularly um and you know some of the people that i worked with founding the upa were already with the social club model and sort of moved over to focus on medical elsewhere um all of these different essentially activist communities because it was an activist group it, you know it was people who um were you know wanted legal cannabis in one form or another and i think like i say the first one of the first things that we did as the upa is really make a clear distinction between medical and recreational um in terms of we just wanted to highlight medical and the, and the law changes needed to let that happen uh, but of course there's the wider you know reform movement around recreational access and i mean nowadays it's it's got even more complicated where we have um we have like an industry council that has subgroups that focus on hemp and CBD and medical and marketing and all these different different things. So um, it starts off very simple with just the Legalized Cannabis Alliance. And, and, and I suppose that's a quite a grassroots activist is group. And we, you know, um, when I first got involved and when I first started to go into those events, um, very much community events, um, 420 in London, Green Pride oh. and Brighton, the sort of biggest two of the year. But Internationally no renowned, no less. Well, yeah. yeah. 420 is map, a big you know, international holiday, isn't it? But um, but Green Pride too. Product Earth, when it started, or that was a bit, I think it was after we'd started with the UP, I think 2016 was the first Product Earth. A um, bit more of an industry thing. Uh, but yeah, these there were sort of events in the calendar and, you know, people would put those calendars together, the sort of canner calendar for the year. And, um, you know, we'd meet up and we'd discuss things and, and, and we'd form different groups. And some of those groups would register as non-profits and, and um, you know, some of them would be more involved in grassroots campaigns as some of them would aim um i want to say aim higher i think both both sides of that are important but i think some would aim at uh, media and, and political engagement i think that's you know that was where we really found our niche as well i think um partly because of how we framed ourselves because we were in suits because we weren't you know sort of representing the uh you know the subculture in in, in such an obvious way um uh, you know, I literally cut my hair. I had long, long, long hair all the way down here. And I was like, people aren't going to take me as seriously. And I hate to do it. Um, but, but it, you know, it, it did work. It genuinely did work to present yourself in a certain way. It's, it's sad that the world works like that and that people are so judgmental on the face of things um, based on what you look like. But it is the world we live in. And I think that's, if there's a takeaway from my entire story, it's, uh, it's it, you, in order to create change you have to deal with the world that you live in not the deal not not the world that you want it's not a utopianism gets this very very you know what's the phrase perfection is the enemy of progress um you know i'd love for a world where people weren't going to be judgmental but there we are it is what it um, is yeah it is what it is yeah no and i think that's that's you know because we represented ourselves or presented ourselves in a in a in a for want of a better term a non-stoner way take from that what whatever you will um people were happy to put us on on mainstream tv and uh, people were happy to politicians were happy to have meetings with us and engage with us and discuss the issue with us i think also because we were talking about medical access so this was uh, particularly politicians felt much more comfortable with that and still do um because it's quite easy to argue that people who find medical benefit from a plant should probably have access to that plant legally not be put in prison for it um and uh and, and have the guidance of a medical professional who can be trained to, to do that properly and that's it's it's fascinating to go back and to talk about all this stuff because i don't i don't spend a lot of time dealing with what's going on in the present and, and actually to reminisce about it to think that we spent all that time fighting for 
what I now do as my day to day job is it's quite amazing really to me that we've we've come a long way. I think there's a lot of hurdles still to Definitely. overcome. Um, but it's important to to take stock and and realize that. And just having that realization as we're on camera here is that how much has changed, how much we've moved forward um in this country since I started at least. And uh like I say, I think what was I? Twenty three, twenty four. I'm 31 now. It's not even been a full decade since I really got engaged. Um, yeah, here we are. So yeah, <laughs> that's that's me in a nutshell, I suppose. That's that's the mm. that's the story. But so Alex, on the note of these patients and these groups, would you be able to help us understand and share for the audience a bit of a reason as to why patients were feeling the need to get together and talk about this stuff what was going on what was it like then could you paint us a bit of a picture as to what that what patients were experiencing what that environment was like and what um how much i guess we've almost progressed since then too yeah i know of course of course so yeah i mean it, it's it's a good point i mean there, there's facebook groups that i've been in since 2014 2015 i'm still in and the conversation has changed drastically um I guess it all. I guess it all starts with with what's going on in the USA and that, that progression and and seeing that roll out state by state. And I, I mean medical more than the the recreational side that sort of came later from I think it's around 2016, isn't it? 2014 uh, with Colorado or even 2012. Anyway, um, and you know I think just patients. It's the internet. The internet's the factor. It's that you know we could share experiences across borders, but of course the law chain is different across borders. So you know a Crohn's patient in the UK talking to a Crohn's patient in California, who you know, and they can get legal access to something. I'm being criminalised for it. Um, you know, risking criminality as opposed to source it and possess it or even potentially grow it, as many patients did and do. Um, and you know, I think that that injustice of well, this is helping me massively. And we have a, you know, we have a very active black market for cannabis in the UK. It's then when you look at statistics, you know, even compared with most other European countries and, and even uh, parts, well, North America has a legal market to compete with it now, but, um, you know, it's very active. It's, you know, it's not difficult to find cannabis in the UK. Um, and, you know, if you go online and you're in these forums that are international, I'm, I'm talking, these aren't cannabis forums, like, a, a you know, a Crohn's forum um and you know it, it, i think we will people are well aware that it's helpful for various different things it's one of the first things my dad said to me when i when i got a diagnosis he was like that thing that you've been using might be helpful to you now and i was like yeah no it is actually <laughs> um people know uh, that, that there had there is this medical potential because people talk about it because people do have very positive experiences and the anecdotal evidence is you know in my opinion enormously compelling and how that translates to clinical evidence is a whole other topic but you know, now we have a better understanding of the endocannabinoid system, all of these things, and all of this information is 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 proliferated around the internet. And I think just patients in the UK were fed up. I think we were fed up with um, the, the law as it was, the fact we couldn't have a good conversation with our doctors about it, relying on, you know, the black market and the risks involved in that. And, and there are some really considerable risks involved in that. Um, and I, you know, I, in the position to have heard a lot of the more the more horrific stories of patients being taken advantage of in various ways and um and i also think they were sick of being lumped in with that sort of stereotype of a cannabis user you know with respect to the the the, the connoisseurs the enthusiasts the, the cannabis um community and subculture i don't think that applies to everyone who consumes cannabis in the same way that you know i'm not a big alcohol you know drinker you can tell from how i'm talking about it <laughs> no one calls it alcohol i'm not a i'm not a pub guy i don't go out to the pub every friday night and it's fine you know i don't mind a pub uh but i'll pop in and have a pint now and again but i'm not your typical you know that that's just not the, the demographic that i fit in um and i think with the medicine it's a very different issue and there's just a lot of crossover between those worlds as well there are people who and this is something i'm trying to explain over and i, I do explain over and over again to uh, doctors, for example, when they're getting involved in, in cannabis prescribing, or even if they're just inquiring about how it works and what it is, is that prior to 2018, prior to the law change and the, and the nascent industry uh, and the private clinics setting up, um, if if a patient found benefit from cannabis and uh, you know illegally consuming it and, and realized that that was something that really helped them, something that was quite evidently going to be a part of their life, the haven for them is the community the the safe place is you know again safety in numbers like i said earlier you know if you get involved with a subculture 
Um, you're going to find other people with a shared interest. You're going to find other people who are taking the same risks you are. So, you know, they have as much to lose by opening up and talking about their cannabis use as you do. Um, so you can you can connect over that when you can't, you know, necessarily have that conversation with even your loved ones. You, you know, and I know lots of patients who for many years hid their cannabis use from their their partners, their spouses, mm-hmm. their children, their parents, um, their friends and family. And that does that does horrible things to you in 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 your head. I think actually doing something you know there's illegal, you know there's a risk involved, you know people are going to judge you, you don't feel like you can tell people. Um, you know, I, I compare it to being you know a homosexual in in the eighties. Um, you know, or, you know, or, you know, um, or a gay person in the eighties. I think that's it's a it, you know whilst they're very different issues i think there's the clear comparison of essentially being closeted which is you're forced to keep what you're doing hidden from general society and you're judged for it uh, and that you know that's a huge impact on people's mental health so you intrinsically going to connect with other people who are in the same position because there's that shared camaraderie and it just got to a head where i think enough patients who had the, the right idea or an idea or the same idea um you know got together shared those insights and and we did that within the subculture that's the important thing. like all of this you could if you talk to people in the industry now a lot of them are quite um you know they'll be quite condescending about the subculture um and i have to you know i have to go back and say look we wouldn't have this industry without the subculture there weren't events that were based around cannabis consumption both recreational and medical there wouldn't have been the spaces Absolutely. for me and the other patients to come together and have these first conversations and start that ball rolling um, and create that safe space. And I, you know, I don't, it's not, it's interesting because when you look at what actually changed the law change, it's those parents of epileptic children. And, you know, how does that fit in with this sort of wider subculture? And I would say, you know, it is the fact that it became a, a topic that people talked about, that people went in the media and, and spoke about that, um, eventually emboldened I presume those parents because I know that you know and you know with absolute utmost respect to all of them um, because my god having a child and talking about illegal activity having a child and talking about cannabis is uh, you know there, there's a lot of risks involved in that um, so I guess it, it you know it got to a point where people just felt like enough is enough we want to we're going to talk about this we don't really care about the judgment stigma anymore and there's enough of us and we're you know united in this um in this fight for this legal access, you know, with multiple petitions with hundreds of thousands of people, all of these things essentially build safety, don't they? Safety in numbers, community behind you. Um, we have people, we would be convicted for, for growing their own cannabis for medical reasons. And a hundred people from, from the community, from the subculture, from the, the different groups would go and support them and stand outside courthouses and, uh, you know, and, and stand outside the jail. So saying you know, free so-and-so for, you know, he's not done anything to hurt anyone. He's just trying to help himself. Um, that community factor is everything in a grassroots, grassroots movement. And it's the grassroots that has led us to the law change. It's the grassroots that's led us to the industry. And it's the, the subculture that was the incubator and, and, and the beginnings of all of that. So we have to be respectful of that subculture. We have to be respectful of the fact that patients have used that. You know, when I say closeted, the closet, you know, the subculture works as a place to have that and to be safe and to, to be a part of that. And that still goes on today, of course. Um, more in relation to recreational consumers, but I think a lot of medical consumers as well, um, because they just don't necessarily know that there is a legal option, or or because it's unaffordable to them. And that's you know we have to be respectful that um, until we get to a point, I think particularly a medical side, until we get to a point where it's you know cannabis medicines are reimbursed on the NHS more widely, um, that will be what it'll be. I think, or you know potentially, or we'll have a, a completely legal recreational market. I actually don't think that's going to happen very quickly in this country, but um, either way, there are ways where this might end, where the subculture will become less meaningful or less important to people. But as it stands, it still is very important, and very meaningful to people. And um, whilst my success came from sort of moving away from that and framing things differently, my job now is very much focused on communicating how important that is um, and has been to patients. And also the, the, the language that's come out of it is a fascinating thing to go to a slightly different topic and, and, and talk about something slightly difficult but, uh, or different. But how we talk about cannabis um, is framed in a subculture rather than it being a medical. So there's a language, there's a different language that's used if you're, a, you know, uh, an enthusiast for cannabis. If I say what an Oz is, <laughs> everyone knows what an Oz is, um, you know, it, on one side. And then if I say on the other side and the medical side, they're, they're talking about, yeah. you know, 
uh, THC CBD ratios and dosage and titration. And, you know, there's this whole world of pharmaceuticals that doesn't understand cannabis. And there's a whole world of cannabis consumers that don't always understand pharmaceuticals. There's crossover on both sides. Don't get me wrong. There's doctors who use cannabis and have done for years. Um, and there's, I'm sure there's many patients who, or sorry, many uh, illegal users who probably also work in the pharmaceutical industry. But I, I essentially am that bridge in my company at least you know as one of the people in the industry that is you know trying to link those things together and, and make this make sense to the people that it that it matters to and that's patients on one side illegal users or legal users and uh, and doctors on the other in essence or the pharmaceutical industry on the other and my god it's, it's fascinating watching these things collide it really is um yeah it, it's an amazing thing we went to we went to an expo called product earth um a couple of when was it about a month ago and um took a few medical professionals into that space as well to speak to some patients and it was fascinating it was absolutely fascinating there was a lot of people there essentially representing the black market and yeah and there was a lot of people there who'd come along as patients who didn't know that it it, it was legal that you could get a prescription for it and what was fascinating to me was even when there was a large you know sort of black market presence shall we say um essentially on a platter for for the people who are in attendance, they were still coming over and, and having a conversation about how they can do this legally and uh, how that works and what that means and what that costs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was fascinating to me. People do want to do things legally. People do want to talk to doctors about their health. I think that's a lovely thing to see. And, and we see it on an individual level where you have you have patients who have, let's say, I mean, it happened to me. I, I we use cannabis and I, I went and told my, my gastroenterologist, my doctor, this is back in God, 2011, 2012. And um, after some time of weighing up whether I should have that conversation with him. Uh, and he was very judgmental. He used to um, take the mick out of my long hair and things as well. So I, I wasn't a fan. Um, we didn't get on. And I didn't, I wasn't fully aware that I could have found an alternative, but um, I wasn't thinking like that. And uh, and yeah, I guess it, so. You've got you've got these patients who who are then sort of pushed away by by medical professionals for one reason or another. Either they're judged, or they're told what they're doing is wrong, or they're told they shouldn't be doing that, or they're denied healthcare. In in some cases, mostly with um, mental health, that that happens where they're actually denied therapy, for example, because they're using cannabis. And they say, well, you can't have you can't see a therapist until you stop using your cannabis. And like, well, I'm using my cannabis to deal with my chronic health issue. I also have anxiety and depression because of the chronic health issue. I want to talk to a therapist. You're we telling me to stop using my medicine, what I'm using to, to yeah. do well, in order to access your treatment. That's absurd. And I, that frustrates the hell out of me. It still happens to this day. Um, so they get pushed away and they go out and, you know, into the wilderness in a, in a sort of metaphorical sense. They go away from doctors and they don't, you know, people with serious chronic health issues go are pushed away from healthcare and pharmaceuticals and, and medical care. Um, and they suffer because of it. It's, you know, it's their own decision. Um, and I'm not going to tell people what they should and shouldn't do. But generally speaking, people with chronic health conditions who don't speak to a doctor for you know a decade or more they're going to be disadvantaged they're not going to know about new medicines that have turned up they're not going to have um, flare-ups managed by you know rescue medicines like like of course the steroids would have been for for me and um what's lovely now is that we actually have some of those patients coming back to us it's difficult because they don't usually have much in terms of medical records so getting them into the legal system is very hard um but it's amazing to see what can happen when you do have a patient who has been out outside of the, you know, in the wilderness, just, so to speak, for 10 to 15 years, and then comes back and is starting to talk to doctors again. And like I say, those doctors have other treatments, new treatments they can recommend, other things that, that they can talk about, not just cannabis. Um, but because cannabis is legal and because they can have that conversation with someone who can even prescribe cannabis medicines, um, they're coming back into the healthcare and we're sort of fixing that uh that breakdown of that relationship between you know medical industry and, and, and patients who have been judged and stigmatized and, and have felt you know felt pushed away from healthcare so that's amazing that's you know that's one of the things I, I see every day that really you know gives me hope that we're doing we're doing good work here i know grow group does a very good job of that patient focus and that was sort of feeds into my next question really annex that yeah. how good of a job do you think we do as an industry of factoring in that grassroots community and the actual people that this industry serves do you where would you score us and maybe how could we probably do better so i know not every not everyone's a grow group for example what um 
what we may be falling short on as well in that process too. Yeah, no. Oh, it's hard to say how to score people because there's different there's different companies, and I think they do they do you know, varying levels of of a good job in terms of that. And there's there's a limit too. I mean, take take strain names. Strain names is a great example. When I start when we started bringing products into the UK, there were no strain names on packaging. No one used strain names. No one no one used words like Kush or Haze. Um, you know, because doctors didn't know what those words meant. They had no idea. But because a large portion of the patients who who went legal, most of the ones at the beginning were those who were more engaged and therefore ones who had already been consuming cannabis um, and had learned all the lingo. Uh, those doctors had to learn. They had to learn what a cush was and a haze was. It's kind of amazing, really, the power of that lingo. These, you know, these words have no medical meaning, like cush and haze. They are, you know, they're as medical as, you know, as, as, as a as dog breeds it's not really a you know it's all a genetic mix really it's not how you know pure breeds and all these things anyway it's it's all to do with genetics it's not you know whilst that's a medical issue slightly but it's <laughs> it's um strain names are not necessary to understand a medicine and then what it's doing and really we should be looking at terpene profiles and things like that but patients don't talk in that way they don't they don't communicate about that they come to the doctor and they say i i find kush helpful and the doctor's like, what is Which Kush? means what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that I know. And then, so before a doctor starts prescribing, I have to have a conversation with them and say, look, if they say this, what they mean is this. If they say Kush, they mean Indica. If they say Haze, they mean Sativa. More often than not. No, it's not always the case. But um, you know, there's a lot of crossover and, 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 and inconsistency. But, but And I pushed for it. I remember pushing for it. I remember in my, I think it was in the first sort of six months or so, saying we should put the stray names on the packaging. We should let patients know what the stray names are because there's a communication point and they'll be able to relate and then they'll they'll feel more comfortable you know, using these medicines and um you know it's a bit of a brand issue as much as anything and that didn't happen for ages and then i think gradually people started doing that and starting putting strain names on and um having that conversation and then talking to doctors about what that means indica and sativa too are not hugely scientific terms um doctors need to understand what terpenes do and what they mean in terms of a profile and how that impacts energy levels and that's blooming complicated really um it's not that they shouldn't or couldn't learn it it's that it's a lot easier for us to say there are these two terms one means sleepy and one means less sleepy or more energizing um they're colloquialisms they're not scientific terms but they're they're shorthand for sleepy cannabis less sleepy cannabis and uh, that's really helpful. That's actually the doctors like that because that makes their life easier. It's not that they're not interested in terpenes and, and the profiles and those effects and digging into these things. But when you have a, a list of however many strains they can prescribe and they're trying to get something that's going to help somebody sleep, they don't want to have to dig into every strain and say which one's high in myosin and beta carophyllene or whatever's going to help you sleep. Um, they want to just see the word indica or sativa or, you know, or a percentage of each and, and then know that. 80% indica, right, well, that's going to help them sleep. I'll, I'll prescribe that. It's the right strain. It's the right um, profile for this patient. And we can give them that guidance using the the non-medical terminology that's been developed by the culture. So there is all this crossover happening. Where that will land in the long term, I have no idea. Um, it could There could be a, a massive sort of backtrack and we could try and medicalize and pharmaceuticalize things and use code names and um you know invent pharmaceutical names for all these medicines in the future and maybe that's maybe that's a good idea maybe that will help get to the nhs maybe that's what we need to do um but it's fascinating to be here at this point in this sort of mid mid period between these worlds and i don't think it will go away because we're seeing you know recreational industries um pop up all over the world they're not going to stop using these terminology um so i don't i don't think it's going to go away and you're going to get that crossover between recreational users and medical users people who use recreationally having you know getting a diagnosis or a condition that, that you know befalls them and then they they realize that what they were doing recreationally becomes a something that they benefit from medically so there's going to be a crossover forever and, and doctors and, and medical professionals will need to understand some of this it's our job as an industry to make it as simple as possible um and to explain why things are the way they are, where these terms have come from, what they mean to patients. And, you know, so doctors can communicate with patients and there's no language barrier. It really is a language issue, um, albeit all in English. It's uh, they're different worlds. Um, and it's, you know, it is fascinating to, to be sitting in the middle of that and essentially be the translator, if you will. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting dynamic that we are where we are. And, um, I'm excited to see where that where that ends up is can I suppose one of the things that's interesting is can can cannabis culture change pharmaceuticals as an industry 
is pharmaceutical industry so big and immovable and it, it historically is both of those things um, yeah can it can it do that it already has in this space but will that breach out into because one of the other things that's interesting about cannabis in the uk is very separated out from other healthcare you know, specific clinics that have been set up to prescribe cannabis medicines because it's so niche because there's so mm. much complexity because essentially because doctors need to be doing it collaboratively so they can learn from each other and and, and um share that knowledge and and so that we have essentially you know uh, a training ground for new doctors so to speak so you know we get new doctors who are interested we they join uh, the md the multidisciplinary team meetings the mdt meetings that the clinic has when it's making decisions for a patient uh, and those doctors join and listen to the the prescribers and the pharmacists and the nurses discussing the patient, discussing what they're going to prescribe and why, um, and learning in 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 that practical way. And that's great. You know, um, it'd be interesting to see though. I do I do wonder what the, what's the limit that of of influence that cannabis can have in healthcare? Because a lot of people, you know, you've got people on, on way off the other side saying, you know, cannabis is a panacea. It's going to revolutionise healthcare. It's going to help us fund the NHS and all these things. And uh, panacea is definitely not true. I mean, let's make that really clear. Um, the endocannabinoid system does a lot of things; it doesn't do everything. Um, but there is a lot that it can do. I really do think it will change how we deal with pain management. I think it will change, uh, which is which is an interesting one in and of itself. We could have a whole episode just talking about that and how you know the the medical system is moving away from wanting to prescribe drugs long term for chronic pain. You know, particularly in the context of opiates uh, and 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 you know other drugs like uh, pregabalin and things um fentanyl and uh, you know they, they're trying to move doctors away from prescribing because there's nothing good that they can prescribe long term for these health issues um and then you're like sitting here in the corner going no actually there might be <laughs> there might be something that's really positive that that really does help people particularly with chronic health uh, issues particularly with immune disorders and uh, inflammatory diseases which is which is you know a big part of where, where you know the, the benefit of cannabis is um and a big part of where pain relief and that problem with long-term pain relief is that and and it's a, a medicine that as far as we're aware can be quite safely consumed quite long term which is you know the opposite it doesn't doesn't ruin liver like like opiates do it's not going to have a, a risk of, of respiratory issues as opiates do um in the same way at all I'm not saying there are no downsides to consuming cannabis or there's no side effects but when you compare the two next to each other i think it's um it's fascinating that the, the healthcare systems are saying we don't have a good solution for long-term chronic pain. And we're sitting here in the cannabis industry with a lot of patients with very successful stories about long-term chronic pain. And I, you know, I'm absolutely one of those patients who's found it. Uh, yeah. Absolutely life-saving for that particular reason. Um, yeah. For you, Alex, as someone who's lived that experience mm. and at a very young age as well, Crohn's at university is not a great time for it to strike. Um, so you don't have to speak on behalf of other people. What was it like for you and how transformative was it for you at that young age? And if there was a medical cannabis system then, what sort of improvement could it have made to your life, do you think? And oh, wow, yeah. How does that maybe apply for some people now as well that are maybe on the edge or? Um, I mean, the, yeah. There's, oh, yeah. There's there's so many. There's, it's 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 a, it's a really personal question, and I, I it's not to say I'm not going to answer it. It's just there are so many ways in which my life would be different if it had been legal to begin with. If I, you know, I, firstly I wouldn't have this job. <laughs> this wouldn't this would have happened decades ago. Uh, you know, we wouldn't need people like me to be training healthcare professionals in 2022 about a plant that people have been using medicinally for thousands of years. Um, so that's that's <laughs> the immediate is I wouldn't have I wouldn't have this job. Um, this industry wouldn't be doing what it's doing. There wouldn't be the stigma. There wouldn't be the judgment. There wouldn't have been the risk of criminality. Um, I would have gone to my doctor and they'd have said, oh, you can try this. This might help with your symptoms. And I'd have had a better relationship with, with my doctor. Like I said earlier, that that judgment, that pushing people away, it didn't push me away from healthcare entirely, but it did make me quite skeptical. Mm. And there were medicines that I was offered uh, immunosuppressant medicines which nowadays are used very very every day uh like and, and are known to be particularly safe because we've seen in practice they're particularly safe but when they first came on the market which is around the time i was offered them there was a lot of sort of oh it might impact your immune system quite significantly in a bad way in the long term and i was 
you know, I I saw the negatives, assume, well, I don't know if I trust this guy. He doesn't he doesn't seem to believe in cannabis. Can he can I trust him to know about other areas of healthcare? And uh he's he's saying this drug might be good for me, but then I go online and people are saying, mm, I don't know though. Uh there's these side effects. We don't right. really know what it's gonna do in the body. And I, you know, I I I don't know what would would you know, if if I'd he prescribed me some cannabis and for my symptoms and, and I'd had a better relationship with with that doctor, you know, whether I'd have taken that medicine or not, I don't know. Maybe I would have, and maybe I'd be a lot healthier. The other thing is, I don't know if I'd have taken that medicine because it does have side effects. I talk of this is particularly infliximabs, the name of the medicine I was offered. It's an immunosuppressant drug, it's still used today. There's different versions of it, and there's newer, refined, better versions in theory. Um, I, I think I'm not an expert on that side of things. Um, I don't know if I'd have taken that medicine, whether I'd be better off or not. I did for a long time think I probably would have been. And then COVID hit. And I thought, well, actually, there's a load of people with compromised immune systems because they've taken drugs like this for a long period of time who are now much more vulnerable to COVID. So I am not vulnerable to COVID particularly uh, any more than anybody else with, with Crohn's disease. Um, and, you know, I, I, if I'd have taken that drug, I, I could have been a lot more vulnerable. It could have been much worse for me in the long term. The other part of it is at uh, about 25 years old, um, I had surgery uh, to remove most of my lower bowel. Eventually, I actually had two surgeries. It wasn't, we didn't go in intending to remove the whole of my lower bowel. Initially, it was a shorter part. And then it's second surgery, like, right, we have to just get rid of the whole thing. Uh, so I have a colostomy bag and I live with that every day. Um, uh, for those who don't know, that is like a bag that's strapped to your front uh, where your intestines come out of your, <laughs> come out of your torso and you essentially poo into this bag. You change the bag every day, every other day every few days uh, when you need to you can empty it and, and stuff like that and it essentially means you can live life without um, you know most of your colon uh, and you can live a pretty good life without most of your colon I live a fairly normal life now with this bag anyway that's that's that thing I just think it's 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 important for me as a patient to do that little bit of advocacy when I say these things so people know what these things are if you don't know um, if you do know good for you um, if you don't now you do um, and that surgery may have been unnecessary if I'd had that that drug, the the immunosuppressant drug, um, and I wouldn't, I would, you know, still have my colon, and I wouldn't have the bag, and, and all these other things. You know, my 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 trajectory basically as a patient could have gone very differently. Uh, that that for me personally is a big thing, um, and it's like that whole thing of you know, you you can never look back in the past and say, well, what if, what if? You can't spend a lot of time dwelling on that. I don't think that's healthy. So, you know, I live with what it is and what I've got. And, 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 uh, and, and you know, I, I, I also, you know, I'm an advocate for the surgery. I think, it, you know, the surgery, you know, when it's needed is, you know, it, 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 that saved my life. Um, you also asked about what it means to consume cannabis, I think, as well. Like, you know, so going back before the surgery, it was a lifesaver. It really was. Um, it's not that the disease would have killed me without it. It's that the symptoms potentially would have been so severe to not have any pain relief it's a horrible pain Crohn's disease it's there are many different types of pain and it's it's way up there um you know and that's not just me saying that that's generally understood um i honestly don't know whether i'd have stuck around i really don't i hate to be morbid about things but i really don't know if i'd have continued with about eight years of pretty severe chronic pain pretty much every day in waves it got better and it got worse and much worse in winter Nearly every Christmas, I'd have a, re a flare up. It's the best time to have a flare up when you're with your family. It's great, um, and uh, you have to have a sense of humour about these things. Um, but I honestly don't know if I'd have stuck around. I really don't. It was it was awful. And having that, having cannabis, having something that I could rely on, that I could go to, that was you know relatively easy to get hold of, obviously with some caveats. Uh, you know that that was able that was helping me. Um, potentially save my life i really don't i don't know where i'd be without it not just the pain but also you know i had nausea helping me sleep helping me have an appetite so i ate so i ate food i could have wasted away without it um the stress could have become too much because you know not sleeping massively adds to your stress so getting a good night's sleep yeah uh, i just i just remember the relief of consuming it after a meal when i'd wake up in the morning before bed um and that oh Oh, I can have a few hours of not even zero pain, like, but 20% of the pain that it was before. Um, and then have an appetite and be like, right, I'm going to eat some food. Knowing in the back of my mind that that food's going to go through my gut. And, and the, yeah, for those who don't know, it's all uh, Crohn's disease and these things are all ulcers on the inside of your digestive tract. And 
food passes through and it's incredibly painful um uh and knowing that food is going to cause that pain but actually because of the the power of the munchies um being able to to get a full meal down me and you know careful what i ate uh, and, and you know go about my life and maintain my weight and maintain my stress levels and maintain my my peace of mind although you know as best as i could um everyone with a chronic health issue will have tantrums and breakdowns and and uh, depression and um you know there's, there's i wouldn't wish a chronic illness on on my worst enemy i really wouldn't so that's that's the the real impact it had it, it quite possibly saved my life um if it had been legal things could have been very different for me in terms of my health care and I, I hold on to all these maybes and, and what ifs and stuff but instead of dwelling on them i get I, I i use that inspiration to make sure that it's working for the next generation that's that's my that's my goal in life if if you are, if you put me to it i don't i don't hugely believe in sort of you're all on this planet for a reason type thing i think it's a bit more wishy-washy than that but um i you know if i have a goal it's that i want to make this kind of medical cannabis system in the uk work to the extent that um if my child had the same situation i had that they would ne- yeah, that they would be just immediately right well this is going to help your pain and your nausea it might give you an appetite here have the prescription go on your way um and if that can be funded on the nhs as well you know that would be that that's the end goal really for me is uh is to get to that point i think it's going to be a long slog to get there um particularly to the nhs but i mean I also did not think when we started in 2014, uh, you know, when I started the advocacy organization with those other patients in 2014, I did not think that I would be sitting here in 2022 talking about prescription cannabis and educating doctors. So you have to look at the, look at how far we've come, even though there's still a ways to go. I was doing a bit of research the other day for some training that I'm doing. And one of the, there was a statistic that 40% of people worldwide have a gut related issues mm. so whether that be yeah ibd colorectal cancer some sort of um, IBS. yeah irritation yeah and so i think i think something that's really overlooked i've been there myself with uh, different gut issues and so it's something that could strike anyone at any point in their lifetime oh, yeah. you've got such yeah. a delicate little environment and a bad disease a bad illness some bad food poisoning for example could completely trash your whole yeah yeah change your life course forever. you know in a wider context i honestly i do think i think the majority of people i'm you know 95 to 100 percent of people will have at some point in their life a symptom that could be managed with cbd or thc or cannabis in some form i genuinely do believe that i think there's um we need to we need to understand what types of cannabis are going to be good for, for for different conditions. We need to do these tests and we need to work out where it's the best place to source these medicines and things like that. Like so, you know, migraine medication is a really good example. It's if you have migraines once a month, I actually have a friend who has migraines fairly irregularly. They're very severe when he has them. He doesn't have them all the time. It's not a hugely sensible system. The, the medical cannabis system we have in the UK is very much sort of a prescription month on month. You can get into the system and get a prescription and just hold on to it. But then it doesn't last for very long. The sort of license for mm. the legality of that prescription is is sort of two months after it's it's um, it's issued, um, and you have the prescription. It's a month's worth of the prescription. So you've got a month leeway, um, and that works for people. You've got a long term chronic issue, and you're using cannabis regularly. That works fine. But if you're if it's one of those things that's like a rescue medicine, it's just going to sit in your cupboard for when you need it. Um, that doesn't work very well for him. So, you know, I, I would like to see some over the counter, very low dose easy to easy to take capsules or oils or something that, that would be for migraines for example this you know this is where i'm seeing in 10 20 years from now i think maybe maybe sooner hopefully sooner um but yeah i think there's there's all sorts of minor issues where it could be incredibly helpful um uh, and and some really unexpected places as well so um one of the best anecdotes i have in this in this space like talking from a uh, to a psychiatrist who we were working with at one of the cannabis prescribing clinics and he had a lot of patients uh, that are in care homes usually it's their children that have said you know there's an issue with this uh, with my, my parents um, and in this case it was a patient in a with dementia in a care home and I think it was a she she was uh, non-verbal she wasn't talking she had what's called behavioral issues essentially she's kicking and hitting the carers in the care home she's very unhappy distressed essentially having tantrums 
dementia essentially does is sort of you know um, reduces your mental capacity and reverts you back to a you know similar to what a child would be like um and that's obviously incredibly difficult it's a fully grown adult acting like a child very difficult for the carers very stressful for the individual of course as well and they prescribed her um i think mostly some cbd dominant dominant uh, capsules in fact and um you know she she became so much calmer and she actually started talking in just a little bit just enough that she verbalized why she was unhappy and i can't actually remember exactly what it was why she was unhappy i think she didn't like the care home in various aspects of the care home they moved her from that care home into a different care home they uh you know which obviously is better for the carers at the previous care home it's better for the individual mm-hmm. it's better for their family who are obviously very worried about their parent uh and the new care home is able to manage that individual um i don't know if they're still using the medication i don't know what's happened since this was over a year ago but um i just think wow if you scale that to the whole issue around care in this country particularly for the elderly particularly for people with dementia and alzheimer's and similar things wow what an impact we could potentially have um i would love to see that scaled up i would love to see someone do a clinical trial with that group of people be complicated it would be incredibly difficult it would be um you know one of the things that's that, that's a topic that's discussed a lot at the moment around clinical trials is can we get grants to fund clinical ca- uh, medical cannabis trials there is there are schemes available it's not always as straightforward as just applying and getting a load of money can you go to a grant scheme and say, I'm going to give some form of cannabis to 1,000, 10,000 people in a care home, give me some money to do it. Um, I want to see if it's going to help them. So we'll see. I mean, hopefully people will, will, will um, you know, this, <laughs> if there's any researchers out there who want to do this stuff, any doctors who want to set up any clinical trials or watching this, get in touch. Um, you know, we're, we're looking for people to partner with to do these things uh, all the time. And, uh, you know, clinical research is the hardest part of this job. It's, it's a real uphill struggle. Um, but it's so important and there's so much potential like i say in so many niche areas where you wouldn't think oh yeah cannabis is great i think there's assumption of chronic pain and spasticity and um, neurological disorders and epilepsy and things and people don't realize that quite how far reaching you know behavioral issues adhd anxiety and depression all of these different things um so yeah i think it's 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 and and you know of course you know with the caveat of it doesn't work for everyone you know it, it's uh it's not a panacea but it, it you know i think there's a there's, there's areas people do not assume that it could be could be helpful with and yet we do hear these stories and we do hear these anecdotes and you know they're not clinical evidence they shouldn't be seen as proof i'm not claiming that those are the first steps to exactly. developing exactly. medical research indeed no um you need the inspiration to to start these things off and that's that's really what i'm you know, I'm, I'm talking to the researchers out there. I'm talking to the doctors. I'm not suggesting this is going to work for any patients watching. That's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is w- what I see as fascinating in my day-to-day jobs. I know the doctors feel the same way that are prescribing it. Um, it's more a call for the medical professionals to engage. That's my, that's my sort of thing over and over again is if you're a medical professional in pain and psychi- psychiatry, I think that you're going to, at some point, you're going to have to learn about this stuff. You don't think you really have a choice. At some point, this is going to be a tipping point. <laughs> it, it's already here and we're, we're already seeing it prescribed to thousands of people. Um, and I don't think it's going away. I really don't. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for taking us through what I think we'll call part one of the uh, conversation and taking us through the patient side of things. Um, do you have any final closing points that you'd like to uh, use to sort of summarize what we've discussed there before moving on to some of the industry elements? So we've we've covered a lot of ground, haven't we? Um, it's uh, yeah, there's so many different things to take. Healthcare professionals need to be paying attention to medical cannabis as a concept, as a medicine, as a as a treatment option. Um, the community uh you know around cannabis i think should be supportive of how far we've come and what we're doing um i think there are ways that we can we can constructively make things better don't get me wrong we're not we're not finished um with making this whole medical cannabis thing work in the uk uh and just you know thank you for having me on thank you for giving me this opportunity to to speak i think it's i i know i've waffled on as i tend to do and you get me started uh on this particular subject and um and, and give me a chance to talk about myself a little as well it's nice to it's nice to process and chat about these things and i, I appreciate the opportunity it's uh thank you for sharing alex no no absolute I look forward pleasure. To returning. you're a mountain of knowledge and so yeah 
Thank you for sharing that with us. And for anyone who's excited to learn more about the cannabis industry, we'll do a part two to this and continue the conversation on and talk more about what the cannabis industry is, how it works, what's going on, and how you can get involved as well, uh, I yeah, imagine, yeah. quite likely. So thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Alex, as well, for joining. Absolute superstar. And uh, we'll see everyone for part two in a few weeks. Yeah. Um, so thanks very much. Take care and uh, see you in the next episode.